very first funeral I ever did, uh, a uh, young man was going to be ordained as a deacon, and he wanted his dad to come to the ordination service because I was going to be preaching salvation. And his dad was not saved. And um, so that Sunday afternoon, he the Sunday before, he went to uh, uh, invite his dad to the uh, church the next Sunday uh, for the ordination service because he knew that um, I'd be preaching Jesus. And that Sunday afternoon when he went to see his dad, his dad had killed himself. And um, so the very first funeral I ever did, I stood over someone who I knew was in hell. Um, that was, I guess, you couldn't get any worse than that. I've done quite a few funerals and uh, preachers like to preach them into heaven. We can't do that. But there are some people you just know that they knew the Lord, they loved the Lord, and that's a comforting time, very, very comforting time. Um, but we always use 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 through 8 for those that we know are Christians. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's a good thing. Breathing your last breath here, you're in the presence of God. That's good. And the word presence there is in the continuing tense. You just don't show up and leave. You get to always be in the presence of God. Forever in the presence of God. Forever knowing the perfection of God. For always in everything, you are right there with God in all the things that only God knows and can do. We need that today. God has provided that today. Not everybody recognizes that today. Jesus was 12 years old. They went to Jerusalem as was their, uh, uh, as was their, their, their privilege, and they would do that every year for the feast. But at 12, Jesus was now a man, and he got to take part in the uh, religious services. And, you know, the family left and went home. And I mean, they, they're on a journey the whole day, and then they realize, where's Jesus? And they're searching all around for him, for him, and then they go back. And the Bible says it took them three days to find him, but they found him in the temple. And, and this is what Luke 2, verse 47 says about those who were there in the temple with Jesus for those three days. All who heard him were astonished at his understanding and his answers. What they didn't realize was they were in the presence of the author. They were in the presence of the Almighty. They were, it says here, the, they were astonished. That really means they had a jaw-dropping moment with this, when, when, when they were in his presence, they felt the presence of God. How very wonderful, because they were in the presence of God. When um, Luke 4 tells us when Jesus began his ministry, he'd been baptized, went out into the wilderness and been tempted, went to his hometown, Nazareth, got the scrolls, spoke the fulfillment of what his life journey would be. And when they heard that, they said these things, is this not Jesus's, excuse me, is this not Joseph's son? This can't be the one who's coming to, to preach uh, freedom for the captives. They knew what that paragraph was. They knew what it meant, but they couldn't take it that it was Jesus saying that about himself. They were in the presence of the Almighty and they didn't know it. In Luke 4, it says, so all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. Instead of being filled with joy, they were in the presence of the one who is joy. Instead of that, they had their feeling 
And it was wrath. Could you imagine being in the presence of God but being filled with wrath? They rose up, they thrust him out of the city, they led him to the broad brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. They were going to try to kill God. That's the wrong reaction. But many had it. I, I'm, I could have used a thousand illustrations, but I'm just going to use two more. In Mark's gospel, in the very first chapter, Jesus had been preaching. He had been with a large group of people. And, and as they were leaving, there was a, a man that came running up to him. And as soon as they saw this man running up to him, you know, other people, their first reaction, it's their human reaction. He was a leper, so that meant that they were backing up probably pick up a stone to throw at him and, and run him off like you would a, a dog. And he came and fell at Jesus and said, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He saw something in Jesus that others didn't see. His question was this, I know you can make me clean. I just don't know if you're willing. But when Jesus was confronted with faith, understanding and belief, a smile had to come up on his face. Everybody else saw, all they could see was the outward appearance. All anyone else could see was this was a leper. Get away, this man can harm us. But Jesus says, I am willing, listen to these words, be cleansed. And the power of God coming through the Son of God, listen to me now, empowered by the Spirit of God, that man was cleansed, he was saved, he was free. More, He had it all at that moment, just like that. He knew he was in the presence. He just didn't know if... He would be the object of God's love, but what he found out was God would give him all that he had because God loved him. In Mark chapter 2, some friends heard that Jesus was in town, and they had a friend. I, I love it. Friends bring, bring friends to Jesus. Y'all good with that? Now, that's a fact. Friends bring friends to church. Friends bring friends to the, to the God of the universe as seen in Scripture. Friends bring friends to, to Jesus. They had a friend who was lame, and they knew Jesus was there, so they put him on a mat, and four people carried him, and they couldn't get in the building. But listen, not only did they bring him, they didn't say, well, we can't get in, we'll come back another day. They, weren't, they were not going to let anything get in the way of their friend finding Jesus. Y'all know the story. They walked up on the roof, and a, a roof would, was a flat roof. They would Underneath it, they would put uh, limbs, and then they would put other things on top of it, uh, branches and stuff, but then they would start packing it with clay, and layer after layer after layer after layer to where it would be a foot 18 inches to where you could hold... Uh, a party on the roof, all those people, because it was, but they weren't, they began to kick and scratch, and somebody probably had a hammer, somebody probably had a stick prying it. They weren't just pulling back leaves. No, they had to, they, there was a work that had to be done, and they're trying to have church underneath it. And they got him in there, and when Jesus saw the faith of the friends, Jesus looked at him and said, your sins are forgiven. Now, there were Pharisees and scribes, religious people that were there. And they were immediately offended because they said, no one can, uh, can, can forgive sins but God. Now, that's good theology, by the way. They were correct. No one can forgive sins but God. They were right. The problem was God was there and they didn't know it. And he said, which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to rise up and walk? But just so that you'll know, 
that the Son of God is here, I'm telling you, rise up, take up your mat, and you can leave. And the man did what he could not do because the power of God was now with him. If you ask him, the one thing he could not do, he didn't have power in his legs, he didn't have ability at all, but he got right up. And by the way, Jesus put him to work. He picked up his mat and he said, uh, I guarantee you they couldn't get in the building, but they, that, don't you know that that crowd scattered as he walked out? And all they were was mad and angry in the presence of the Almighty. Mad and angry in the presence. Your sins are forgiven you. Hear me, please. Are you listening? May we not miss His presence too. That's what we just sang about. Your presence. We've been in looking into Scripture for the last couple months and we've been highlighting the Holy Spirit is God. He's God's gift. We've talked about the anointing. We've talked about the baptism. We've talked about the works of the Holy Spirit. We've talked about all of those things here, but I'm still telling you here, it, it matters so much that we understand that that's God's gift for you. He cares so much about you. And he, you have God's attentive focus. Jeremiah chapter 1 said, Before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. Before you were created, I sanctified you. God had plans for your life. God wanted, there's, there's, he knows every thought that you've ever thought or will ever think, and He still loves you. You're trying to please Him. Understand, the only thing that can keep you from pleasing God is by faith you need to allow Him into your life. By faith you need to accept Him. By faith you need to receive Him. You really need to receive all of Him. Listen. Listen. There is a trinity. Let's go over this. Y'all ready for Sunday school? God the Father, say it with me. God the Father, God the Son, and God the... That's not 1A, 1B, 1C. That's one. Right? One. You can't take part and reject the other. There are a lot of people who want to say, well, I, I believe in God, the Father, but I'm not going to ever believe in Jesus. I, I know. Well, then you don't know God the Father. But you say, well, I, I understand God the Father, and, and, and yes, I, understand, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. But unless you, come on now, embrace the Spirit of God, you're missing God's gift to you. He didn't just send an angel to be a guardian over you. He came first person. Singular. The Holy Spirit. I didn't get the leftovers. I got the real thing. Amen. I didn't get part. I got all. Anybody in here have needs in your life? Anybody have circumstances that are hard? I guarantee you, if you look to the person beside you, you don't know what they're going through, have gone through. I dare say that there are people in this room that are sick that don't even know that they're sick. I dare say that there are people in this room that are facing things financially. There are, there are conflicts. There are some, some things that they've been uh, holding in their life that are hurting them. There's some unforgiveness in this room. There is some that part of vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith me. And because you've tied 
Yeah, the, the Bible's very frank. If you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. Are y'all okay with that? There's some hurt and there's some pain all over this place. And you never know when the next circumstance is coming. Wouldn't it be good to have a God who knew what was going to happen before it happened and prepared you for what you were going to go through before you actually faced it? And he already had a plan for good to come out of that. I mean, if we're going to believe Scripture, Brother Broadus loves Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says, All things work together for good. To those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Are y'all okay with all things? For that to happen, if God's going to work in all things and make good out of nonsense, then he's going to have to be God there. And he's going to have to have his hand in it. I don't know why we treat the Holy Spirit like the red-headed stepchild. Like an add-on. Like he's not important. Let's take our Bible and look in John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Don't be scared. I know what time it is. <clears throat> John chapter 14, verse 16. John chapter 14, verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and He will give you another Helper, that He, capital H, that is the Holy Spirit, may abide with you forever. He will give you another Helper, that He may abide with you forever. Look in chapter 14, verse number 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Hold on. He's going to teach us what? All things. Anything that we need, we don't, need, we don't have to Google it. We just got to spirit it. That may not be good grammar, but it works, doesn't it? All things that you need. Have y'all ever read the book of Proverbs? I've been reading the book of Proverbs. Uh, I, I read that book 12 times a year. You know how I read that book 12 times a year? There, how many months are there? Okay. How many books are, how many, how many chapters in that book? 31. How many days are there in most months? 31, you, you, you know, February, you get to read a little extra. And it's a book of, you can read one chapter a hundred times and go the hundred and first time and find wisdom there that you've never seen before. And God will perfect that in your life. What I have found is what I need, this, what I'm going through, He will bring Scripture to me ahead of time just to bless because He loves me. Isn't that amazing? How many of y'all have done that? Isn't it funny how a sermon or a song that you hear or, or, or someone will say something and it's exactly... Don't you think God might be up to something here? The Helper. Look in chapter 15, verse number 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, He will testify of me. That is Jesus Christ. He will testify of Jesus. When the Helper comes, I shall send to you from the Father the Spirit. He is the Spirit of truth. If Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, the Holy Spirit will manifest that way to you, that truth to you. He will produce that life in you. Look in chapter 16. John 16, verse number 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, 
I will send him to you. Y'all, let, let's say this again. And this time we're going to put M-E at the end of it. Y'all ready? It says, I will send him to me. God will send him to me. The word helper there means comforter. Anybody need comfort? Anybody need answers? It also means summoned. Summoned. Summoned from God to us for our benefit. My mom used to ring a bell. <clears throat> she'd go to the window. It was a little bitty bell, but she You know what that meant? Food's on the table, get home. And, and, and we had this thing in our neighborhood. If I was playing up the street and people heard the bell, Brian, your mama's ringing the bell. And in just a second, this little white streak would come flying down the road. And I would bust into the house and I would go to the bathroom and I would wash my hands because my mama made me wash my hands for I ate. And we would sit down to the table because she had something prepared for me. And when my mama cooked, it was good. And we filled our plate. And by the way, we always ate everything my mama put on the, on the table. These people who say, well, I don't eat that. You didn't come to my mama's house. I can never tell you of a time my mama put something on the table that I didn't eat it. And it was good. She had prepared it for us. First time I saw oyster stew, I wasn't too sure but I got seconds. Y'all hear me? How hungry are y'all today? You know God's got something prepared for you today? He, he pulled it out of His recipe of wisdom and He has put it together just for us. It means called to one side. Especially for one's aid. He is an advocate. He is an intercessor. I'm going to say a phrase here. I hope you hear. All that you need, the Lord has provided. As a matter of fact, can we just say that together? All that we need, the Lord has provided. I want you to really believe this in your heart and in your soul. Let's try it one more time. All that we need, the Lord has provided, has. It's already been taken care of. The gift of the Holy Spirit. My problem is I think too many people are missing it. Just like those Pharisees and scribes, Jesus was trying to tell them the truth, but they didn't want to hear the truth. Don't miss it. So look for Him. Look for Him. I mean, seriously, look for him. If circumstances are coming up, stop and say, Jesus, where are you in this? Look for him. It's too important to miss. He's here. He wants to bless. We need to learn to shut out the noise, the clatter, the chatter. Does anybody in here ever feel depressed or pushed down upon? If you ever got into that moment where the Satan just keeps coming and he keeps reminding you of all the mistakes that you've made and how you've messed up and, and, and he just wants to, to push you down. Listen, that's not the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is an encourager. Satan is the one that's the discourager. We need to quiet the noise. Sometimes it's the noise of our own activity. 
Sometimes we're, we're so busy, we're so busy, we're so busy, we're, we're running from one thing to the other. You know, Martha got mad at Mary, her sister, because she was in there working and cooking and all that, and, and Mary was just sitting at the feet of Jesus. Sometimes we need to put the pots and pans down and just go sit at the feet of Jesus and worship. Your presence, Lord. Sometimes we need to shut out the noise and be careful of all those distractions. I'm taking a fast from social media. If I haven't returned something from you, I'm sorry. I didn't see it. I, I got this thumb thing I didn't know I had. It has a twitch. Anybody of y'all got a thumb that twitches? You get on there and you're going... Oh, it's your finger. You do your first finger. You got the whole wrist thing going here, don't you? And the next thing you know, an hour's gone by. What in the world did we do without those contraptions? What do we, a lot. I love that. Who said that? Amen, hallelujah, bless God. What did we do for them portable distraction machines? We did a lot. Um, take your Bible and turn off the distractions. And by the way, take a notepad because if those distractions come up, the person you need to call, it's always good things that you need to do. Just write them down in your notepad and get back to God. Also, if you've got a notepad, God might tell you something that you need to hear. Write that down too because you'll want to be reminded of that. Spend time with God. Get away the noise. Get away the distractions. He's look, look for Him. Practice attentiveness. How many of y'all have ever been to a restaurant and you saw a couple sitting there at a, at a booth and they had that thing in front of them doing this? And they're not talking to each other? How, how many of you have ever... Well, we have a at, at our house... We've got a couch, we've got two rocking chairs, we've got other chairs over here. But my wife and I have, have a, a love seat that has a little thing in between us, a little, you know, console where she can keep her candy in it, where she can put her Diet Coke. And, and that's our place. The kids know it. And, and that, that's my chair and that's her chair. And we come in there. And, and we may be watching something, and my wife will reach over and grab my hand now, we may be watching a TV show, but she just wants me to know that she's there with me. I love that. I love that. I may go into the kitchen while she's cooking food, and I'll just put the bear hug on her. Most of the time, she says, I love you too. Sometimes she says, quit. I don't want to be absent from my wife, right? We might be sitting beside each other and be absent from each other. I want to be present. Present. I will never leave you or forsake you. Matter of fact, sometimes we won't. She, she calls me, she calls it checking in. She'll just, I was thinking about you and I just wanted to hear your voice or I'm just checking in. To me, that's love. That's attentiveness. A couple weeks ago, I introduced y'all to your first eight minutes. How many of y'all are still doing that? Some of y'all need some homework. First eight minutes of your day, before you do anything else, spend eight minutes with God. Talk to Him for eight minutes. It'll change your day. It'll change your day. I'm going to ask you to do something different. Keep doing your first eight minutes. I want you to count your close encounters with God. As you're walking your day and you have a close encounter with the Lord, make note of it. Make note of it. Because I think we're just going through our day and we're so busy doing this. And By the way, you can do work and still have your presence in the Lord. Right? You can drive down the road and, and you can still 
be in the presence of the Lord. But there are times when the Lord comes by. Don't miss Him. Don't miss Him. Count them. I think you'll be shocked. So that's your homework this week. That's your to-do list. Now you say, I don't want to count them. I just want to enjoy them. Do it for a week just so that you can be more aware. That's all. Be attentive. Count them. Did y'all know how many disciples were there in the Bible? Anybody know? Y'all need to be in Sunday school. How many disciples were there, Rick? Say it good and loud for them. He knew the answer. Say it one more time for the people online. They still didn't hear you. Twelve. Did you actually know that there's 13 disciples? Did y'all know that? His, the names were changed to protect the guilty. The, y'all, wanna, y'all want me to tell you whose name was? The 13th disciple, his name was Brian. But y'all don't read about him in Scripture, do you? Because he was always wandering away. See, Jesus had this teaching moment, and, and, and he was um, walking back, and this lame man came running up. But Brian missed it because Brian saw a friend over there and wanted to go catch up with him. Hadn't seen him since high school, and he missed it. So he, when he caught up with them, they said, hey, you missed it. What did I miss? Jesus just healed a man with leprosy. He, had, he was eat up with it all over his body. His nose was about to fall off, but Jesus just healed him. His skin was perfect. He was perfect from head to toe. He didn't even have a, a freckle out of place. Man, I can't believe I missed that. He just always was distracted and going off someplace else. When they took that man on the mat and tore up the roof and lowered him down and a lame man got healed, Brian was at the ball game. You know, he had a free ticket. Somebody was so nice to him and loved on him and gave him a free ticket to the ball game. So Brian went to the ball game. But when he caught up with them, they said, I can't believe you missed it. Because he wasn't close. He just distracted. Just off doing other things. Those things that in the moment are so important. You know, good is the enemy of better. And we like better, don't we? But even it's the enemy of best. And there are a hundred different levels of love. But at the top of that should be our highest love for Christ. And to spend time with Him. I'm not saying don't love your friends. I'm not saying don't love your family. I'm not not saying don't love your country. I'm not saying don't love bowling. I'm not saying don't love anything uh, that that you enjoy, but just understand that there's an opportunity that you can go fishing with Jesus. You can go bowling with Jesus. You can go to work with Jesus. You you can go vote with Jesus. You, You can do all the things. You can actually even come to church with Jesus. How many of y'all been hearing a sermon and you think, you know, I need to get some Clorox at the store and you use the bulletin as a grocery list? Don't raise your hand. Charles, you scratched your jaw. Does that mean you did it? (laughs) If the preacher would just hush, they got an early special at the steakhouse. No, they don't. By the way, Brian wasn't the 13th disciple. You can just insert your own name there. 
I ask you, are you going to miss what God has planned for you? Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for good and not evil to give you a future and a hope. But it also says this. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from the nations, from all the places where I've driven you. That The key word there is not in verse 11, for I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans of peace and not of evil to give you a future. And I hope, no, the, the, the word that is important is in verse 12, it's the very first word, then. He says, you're going to go spend. Verse 10 says, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you, and you shall return to this place. He knew circumstances were going to happen beforehand. God told Jeremiah, you're going to go to Babylon. You're going to go to captivity. But understand, I know the plans that I have. Then, when you search for me, you will find me. You will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. Key word is then. Church, this morning is, are you going to be a part of the then? How many times has the Lord come by speaking to your, whole, your soul and you said, not now? That's why people that should be saved go to hell. And if you're here today or you're watching online and you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, Please don't miss it. Please don't say no to the Holy Spirit. Say yes. But if you're here today and you're a Christian, don't miss what he's got prepared for you.